Casey's Top 40. I'm Casey Kasem. Now, we're up to the latest hit for a seemingly wild, out-of-control rock star. A singer who's actually so well-organized, he uses a computer to keep track of all the different outfits he wears. If you've ever seen Steven Tyler, lead singer of Aerosmith, in any of his videos or in concert, you know he's a wildly outrageous rocker. He dresses in indescribable outfits. Outfits that he puts together out of spandex and feathers, leather and lace, scarves and sashes, rings and necklaces. But as over the edge as he seems to be, Stephen is amazingly organized when it comes to fashion. He takes a laptop computer with him on tour everywhere he goes. And on that computer, Stephen has a list of every bit of clothing in his vast wardrobe. He uses a system of codes to indicate which outfits work together and which outfits don't. His codes run from MO for mediocre to OR for outrageous. What's more, whenever he wears something, Stephen inputs that fact into the computer. That way, he'll be sure not to wear the same outfit again in the same city or even anywhere close to that city. That's because Steven Tyler believes his audience shows up every bit as much for him and his wild man image as for the band's music. And he wants to make sure his audience sees a new Steven Tyler every time he goes out on stage. Well, while Steven keeps track of his outfits on a computer, he keeps track of his band's many hits by checking the charts. Casey's Top 40. I'm Casey Kasem. Well, now we're up to the latest hit for Aerosmith, a band whose lead singer, Steven Tyler, uses an ancient Chinese secret to reduce stress. Steven says he discovered that secret one day when he was just a child poking around in his father's sock drawer. There he found two chestnuts. Mystified, Stephen asked his father why they were there. And Stephen's dad, who's a pianist, explained that by using those chestnuts, he was able to ease cramping in his hands and reduce stress throughout his body. Stephen wanted to know how. And his dad showed him by rubbing the chestnuts in the palm of his hand, passing them over his fingers, never allowing the chestnuts to touch. And as the chestnuts manipulated certain pressure points, they relaxed and soothed both the hand and the entire body. Well, years later, when Stephen had become a professional musician, he remembered his dad's secret. And he discovered that it wasn't really his dad's secret at all, but an ancient Chinese secret, what are called Jiang Shin Balls. They've been in use for over 3,000 years, and Stephen says they work wonders. He has a specially made set of hollow silver balls with chimes inside. And whenever the stresses of his rock and roll lifestyle get to be a bit too much, he pulls them out, rolls them around in his palm, and lets the tension ease. But there's not much for Steven Tyler to be tense about this week because his latest single with Aerosmith is rocking up the chart, heading for the top ten. Rolling up four notches to number 13 on Casey's Top 40, this is Living on the Edge. Well, back in 1971 when this band didn't have a paying gig, they just set up on the sidewalk at Boston University and play for free. Can you imagine seeing Aerosmith for free? 20 zillion gigs and a hundred gazillion dollars later, they're at number 17. Casey's Top 40. From Hollywood, this is Casey Kasem. Now we're up to Steven Tyler, a rocker who back in the late 60s was introduced to a band he said was the worst he'd ever heard. <laughs> Today, he sings lead for that legendary rock band. At the time, Steven was going to Roosevelt High School in Yonkers, New York. And on weekends, he'd go to Sunapee, New Hampshire and play drums in a band at a resort his parents owned. In Sunapee, that was the big time, and it attracted all the local musicians like Joe Perry and Tom Hamilton, two teenagers who played in a group called the Jam Band. One night at the resort, Joe Perry got up the nerve to approach the band and invite Stephen to one of their shows to see what the Jam Band could do. Stephen went, not expecting much. <laughs> and that's just what he got. He says the Jam Band was terrible. Quote, they couldn't even tune a guitar. Still, there was something about their raw power that attracted Stephen. They had a rock and roll spirit, a ragged, spontaneous groove that came across in every note they played. So even though he thought they were terrible, Stephen just couldn't get that groove of theirs out of his mind. He says, quote, I knew if I could show them a little of what I knew, combined with the looseness they had, then together we'd really have something. And was he right? In time, Stephen quit his group to join the jam band. And then, with two more new members, they changed their name to one that would make rock and roll history. The name, 
Aerosmith. These days, almost a quarter of a century later, Aerosmith is still going strong as their 14th Top 40 hit moves up four notches to number 32 on Casey's Top 40. Casey's Biggest Hit. Six years ago this week, back in 1988, one of the biggest hits in the USA was Angel by a supergroup that says for them, in their early days, a bowl of soup was a treat. We've heard a lot about acts having to survive on a near-starvation diet, and the supergroup called Aerosmith is no exception. They used to share a tiny, cluttered apartment in Boston with two of them sleeping in the living room and one of them in the bathtub. They were playing for spare change on the street at the time. And they were living on a diet of jelly sandwiches, brown rice, and, when they could afford it, a can of tomato soup. They were one lean, hungry rock band. And that hunger gave them the desire to make it. Something that they've been doing now for 20 years. Six years ago this week, they had one of the biggest hits in the USA. Here's Aerosmith with Angel. Casey's Top 40. I'm David Perry for Casey Kasem. Now we're up to the song called Crazy by a band whose lead singer is famous for his crazy outfits. Outfits he says he was wearing long before he was a star. Back in his teens when he'd pull his look together from stuff he'd buy from the Salvation Army. Steven Tyler, lead singer of the group Aerosmith, is one of the wildest dressers in rock. His long, lean, lank frame is always covered in layers of leather, lace, chiffon, all sorts of impossible combinations that only Steven Tyler could pull off. And Steven says this just isn't a look he grew into. He's been dressing like this ever since he was a teenager. Back then, he'd take the train in from the suburbs to New York City, where he'd go shopping in Greenwich Village. He remembers seeing Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones buying his clothing at Paul Sargent's and talking about shoes with Bob Dylan at Bloom Shoe Gallery. He recalls buying a pair of bright blue moccasins there. But most of Steve's clothing came from the Salvation Army, where he'd turn other people's discards into his own unique look. One of his favorite items was a mink vest he made out of an old ratty mink coat. Stephen says he'd wear that vest with wide whale corduroy pants, purple suede boots, and a long flowing scarf and be the coolest dude around. A style he says hasn't varied over the years one bit. This week, uniquely attired Stephen Tyler and his band Aerosmith have survey song number 12 on Casey's Top 40. Here's Crazy. Come here, baby. Well, now we're up to the song Shine, and it's by a band that recently went on their first tour, opening for the veteran rock band Aerosmith. And Aerosmith welcomed them to the road in their own special way. You know, legend has it that when sailors cross the equator for the first time, they're initiated by Neptune, king of the sea. They're doused with seawater, put on trial, and finally declared true sailors of the seven seas. And when a new act goes on tour with a veteran band like Aerosmith, pretty much the same thing goes on, as Ed Rowland and his group Collective Soul learned earlier this year. Steven Tyler and Aerosmith have been rocking and rolling for almost a quarter of a century. They've seen it all, and they've done it all. And they've played plenty of pranks on their opening acts. Usually they save their best practical jokes for the last show of the tour. In the past, they've dumped hundreds of pounds of breakfast cereal on the heads of the members of their opening acts and drowned them in a sea of feathers released from the rafters. So it's not surprising that Steven Tyler and the boys had something very special in store for Collective Soul on the last show of their tour together this year. As Collective Soul was finishing their set, the members of Aerosmith and their crew surrounded the band and the rock and roll veterans pelted the newcomers with a barrage of marshmallows and with oodles of silly string, the spray string that comes out of aerosol cans and gums up everything it touches. By the time Aerosmith was done, the five members of Collective Soul were covered from head to foot. But good troopers that they were, they kept on playing to the end, enjoying every moment of their rock and roll initiation. Casey's Coast to Coast. Now we're up to the current hit by Steven Tyler and Aerosmith. His trademark is the colorful scarves he ties on his microphone stand. But they weren't always trademarks. They used to be his camouflage. You know, it may be hard to believe, but once upon a time, all the way back in the 70s, Aerosmith wasn't the incredibly popular band they are now. In fact, early in their career, a lot of people just didn't understand both the band and their flamboyant lead singer, Steven Tyler. 
As the group made the transition from a club band playing top 40 cover songs to a concert act playing their own original material, they went through a very tough period. You see, they were often called upon to open concerts for groups that weren't exactly a great match for their hard-driving rock. Acts like the Mahavishnu Orchestra, an avant-garde jazz fusion group. Sometimes people in the audience would become impatient as they waited for the headliner to come on. They'd scream rude things at Aerosmith and yell at them to get off the stage. Well, Steven Tyler says that sometimes he just wanted to hide. Quote, I put up with that for the longest time, and just like the guitar player who combs his hair down over his face to hide behind, I needed something to hide behind too, unquote. And that's when he started to bring his scarves on stage and use them for camouflage. These days, of course, Stephen doesn't need to hide from the audience, quite to the contrary. But he still brings his colorful scarves on stage, and instead of being camouflage, they've become his trademark. Another trademark is Stephen's powerful voice you can hear on survey song number 26. Here's Stephen Tyler with Blind Man. Casey's biggest hit. Seven years ago this week, back in 1989, one of the biggest hits in the USA was by a band that owes its existence to an ice cream shop in Sunapee, New Hampshire. It was back in the summer of 1970 that Joe Perry was working as a soda jerk at the Anchorage Ice Cream Parlor in the resort town of Sunapee. One of his regular customers was Stephen Perry, who worked at the nearby Tro Rico Resort. When Joe wasn't making malts and shakes, he and Stephen would get together to listen to music. And when the summer was over, they decided to make some music of their own. That was the beginning of the band called Aerosmith. And seven years ago this week, Aerosmith had one of the biggest hits in the USA. Here's Love in an Elevator. Top 40 Countdown. I'm David Perry. And sliding three notches to number 27 on the top 40 is Aerosmith, whose members have maintained a down-and-dirty rock and roll image for more than 25 years now. Which is why it's surprising to hear that singer Steven Tyler's favorite movie of all time is the colorful family classic The Wizard of Oz. Here's Steven lending his own colorful vocal style to Aerosmith's current hit, Pink. There they are, Aerosmith, five guys who back in the 70s used to rehearse in the basement of a girl's dorm at Boston University. Not a bad deal. This week they fall eight notches to number 35 with Pink. Well, now in American Top 40, we're up to a movie song by a supergroup whose leader agreed to record it so that he could spend some long-needed time with his movie star daughter. Steven Tyler is the lead singer of the band called Aerosmith. He's also the father of actress Liv Tyler, one of the busiest young actresses working today. And therefore lies the problem. As the leader of Aerosmith, Steven Tyler is always on the road or in the studio. As a highly in-demand actress, Liv Tyler is always on location for one new film or another. They hardly ever get to see each other. As Steven Tyler says, they get to see more of each other in magazines than in real life. And so when he was asked to record a new song for the soundtrack for the movie Armageddon, Steven Tyler jumped at the chance. He was told that the video for the song would involve live appearances by the film stars, including his daughter Liv. Steven Tyler says, quote, I figured I would finally get to spend some time with her. I never see her. She does three movies to my one album. And so they had a father and daughter reunion. Thanks to the video of the song that's at number 13 this week on American Top 40, here's Aerosmith with I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Hi, this is Casey Kasem. You know, in the 25 years of hitting the pop chart, the band Aerosmith has never scored a number one hit. But now, they're on the brink. You see, the Boston boys are currently at number two, eyeballing that top spot with the song, I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. Will Steven Tyler and the boys finally lay claim to a number one pop hit? Find out when we count down all the biggest hits in the USA on American Top 40 from AMFM Radio Networks. And that means we're up to the brand new number one song in the USA on American Top 40, a smash from the movie Armageddon that sets a new record, the record for the longest wait by a group between its first chart appearance and its first number one hit. Until now, that record was held by the British supergroup called Yes. They first hit back in 1971 with the song Your Move. 
It wasn't until 12 and a half years later in 1984 that they finally scored with their first number one single, Owner of a Lonely Heart. Now that record stood as the all-time record among groups for many years, until this week. The group that breaks that old 12 and a half year record waited twice as long as Yes for their first number one. This rock band from Boston first charted back in 1973 with their classic hit Dream On. And now, 25 years later, they finally reached number one for the very first time. And this is the week they did it. The brand new number one song in the USA on American Top 40 is I Don't Wanna Miss a Thing by... Aerosmith. I could stay awake just to hear you breathing. Watch you smile while you are sleeping, while you're far away and dreaming. These are the most popular songs in the USA. The 14th most popular song in the USA is by Aerosmith, a band so popular over the last quarter century that later this month they're going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Alive and rockin', here's Aerosmith moving up two notches with Jaded. Smith with Jaded, their 22nd Top 40 hit. This week it climbed from 16 to 14. American Top 40 